Christ, I'm going to have to replay all Dragon Age games for this video. It's a tale we have all heard once too many. Bioware, daddy of role-playing games, strays from his path, turns to drink and beats his wife. Only in this scenario the wife is portrayed by a video game series and the drink is of course EA's money. Grab yourselves a drink, heat up that greasy kebab that's just sitting on the kitchen counter, waiting to give you the ultra shits and follow me into the abyss. Io sono Artoria, sono il cavaliere più figo di tutta l'ordra, so pure il lupo. No, god fucking damn it, Artoria, it's not that abyss. Every fucking time. November 2009. Seven years of development, though I would wager that full-blown production hasn't started until Bio Daddy was done sculpting everyone's favorite Star Wars knockoff, Mass Effect, culminated in what many would call a masterpiece. The overall user score on Metacritic is 8.8, .8, which initially surprised me very much. That is, until I dug a little deeper and read through some of the most negative reviews. Take this one here, for example, by Objective 3 Review. Fucking pleb couldn't even spell objective. It cites the lack of true classic role-playing mechanics, which to any mentally fit individual would be A. An engaging and deep combat system B. A great and interesting storyline C. Interesting characters D. Interesting quests Not to that inbred schmuck though. His main issue with the role-playing mechanics was the lack of fishing minigames or mounts. So I don't think we need to deconstruct this particular review any further to see what's fundamentally wrong with it. Let's move on to another window licker. We Jobo, which says that combat is absolutely terrible. It is also disgusted at the thought of developers thinking it is good. This could be a somewhat valid point in the way that tactical combat is not for everyone. However, to insinuate that no person of higher brain capacity than We Jobo could enjoy it is just plain fucking stupid. Of course, it doesn't end there, as it says that it just helplessly watched its characters die. Now, listen. There are full difficulty levels in the game, and if I can play on Nightmare quite comfortably, and this numbskull can't handle easy, then I believe their issue is far deeper than we could have anticipated. I personally blame the school system for abandoning a clearly disabled child and unleashing it upon the world, free to do anything at once like watching paint dry or something similarly stimulating. Let me get one more review in before moving on. This one was written by Gregs, who admits that the game does have what makes a great RPG, but because he didn't like the combat, Gregs gave it a fucking zero. Now that we know why the user scope is as low as it is, we can continue. The classic PC RPG fully modernized to appeal to the new generation of gamers all over the world. Turn-based combat that entertained our fathers and, let's be real for a second here, our mothers didn't have time to play video games. Anytime they wanted to relax and do something for themselves, somebody would step in at the 11th hour to shit the bed. That very same combat system turned into a real-time one with a tactical twist, where you assigned roles and tasks to every one of your party members. Pause and change things up whenever you like. Spend enough skill points on tactics and enjoy the ability to just sit back and enjoy the mass murder your goons commit over and over again. Visually, it was not a stunning game. If Dragon Age Origins was a dog, it would be the Chinese crested dog. Some combat animations were also questionable as everybody seemed to be in a never-ending state of constipation. Dragon Age Origins story and the world in general are quite dark, heavily inspired by the works of J.R.R. Tolkien and George R.R. R. Martin. It was a breath of fresh air to see a fantasy RPG with high production value. Kings and queens, darkspawn and dragons, magic and swords, racism and classism. Vermin. <laughs> Without any further ado, 12 years after the game's release, let us dive into it. See what it did right, less so, and just plain wrong, and where it went from there. Starting with character creation system, which was very good for the time it came out, especially if you were to compare it to other big role-playing games. Fallout comes to mind. I love RPGs and the ability they give us to express ourselves in fictional worlds. I always create characters that closely resemble my real-life appearance for maximum immersion. A selection of two genders, very discriminatory towards my non-binary, agender, two-spirit, transgender homies. Once you select a real one, you can then pick a race. 
dominant human, the long-eared bottom feeder, otherwise known as elf, or the dummy-thick dwarven child with natural resistance to intelligence and development past the age of 12, making it incapable of wielding magic. You filthy little mob blood. Once that choice is done, you then move on to classes, which you stick with for the entire game. That's not to say every time you choose a warrior class your playthrough will be the same, not at all. Every class has a series of subclasses, which are then complemented further by specializations. Humans can be anything they want, even a woman can be a capable warrior. Truly a great, albeit unbelievable fantasy. I get the concept of suspension of disbelief, but there is a line. Elves can also be anything they want, but they do have a natural affinity to magic due to their brittle bones which often crack and break from strong wind gusts, which by the way leads them to choosing lives as filthy hobos amongst the trees. Even those who actively choose to live in cities as slaves tend to stick to areas where thick shrubbery is always a stone's throw away. Dwarves, as previously mentioned, do not develop intellectually past the age of 12, and so they can only be warriors or rogues. Credit where credit is due, the childness, so to speak, grants them resistance to magic. Whoever you end up playing as will have lasting consequences. A human noble won't have to struggle much in terms of interactions with others, except for the Dalish elves who tend to hate you and your entire gene pool for practicing... um... ownership of city elves and treating them as lesser than men. The hairy manlet might be perceived as a simple analphabet who pops a semi at the sight of golden ale, whereas the lanky bottom feeder might not be taken seriously by those in power. I believe I have played this game at least five times to completion, never as dwarf, therefore it was only appropriate that I correct the error of my ways and choose the castless manlet. Seemingly, my only hope for a better life is my dog-faced sister here, who's trying to bag a noble. She keeps saying that some dude is interested in her beef curtain, but I know better than to trust that mangy bush pig, and so off I go to meet my boy Leska. Let me just quickly say hi to the skunk musket that is my mother. Uh, who's that? Why are you bothering me? Rika? Don't you talk to me like I'm an idiot! You think I don't know my own kid? What are you doing here anyway? Rika said you were finally making something useful of yourself. See, this is what I love about a non-voiced protagonist. Generally speaking, it leads to a more varied and interesting dialogue. I'm not saying non-voiced is inherently better every time, but if the character is a blank canvas on which you are free to paint as you please, then yeah, non-voiced is better. And if you disagree, then you're wrong and arrogant. Unfortunately, upon seeing the overwhelming brownness, I realized that my spoiled eyeballs aren't used to such graphical fidelity. So let me just put some makeup on the game real quick. <laughs> Cool. This should make everything a little more bearable. As soon as my best friend is done talking about how much he would like to fuck my sister, off we go to see the guy who's been stealing from our boss. But no hot-blooded dwarf can help himself. Those perfect lips, just made to be screaming my name. You must have had a few naughty thoughts yourself, huh? You can go about the quest several different ways. You can convince him to give you some of the stolen goods, lyrium in this case, which is a type of magical ore that can enhance equipment and combat abilities of those who find crack and crystal meth to be a little too pedestrian. You can convince him to give you everything he has and force him to disappear from Ozamar, the underground dwarven kingdom. Naturally, you can also choose to do none of the above and instead simply shank the poor fuck. The point is that right from the start, the game offers you several choices in how you choose to go about your business. Well, let's let's give the let's give the large truck outside some time to pass before moving on. Oh, yo. Oh. Let me let me just let me get a sip of my honey tea here. Oh. 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 Ah. The point is that right from the start, the game offers you several choices in how you choose to go about your business. 
there is another two-part quest before the game actually starts, and it's typically a longer, more complex quest involving some fighting, some traps, dialogue, etc. I don't want to go into too much detail about every single quest, because nobody would watch this fucking video if I did, so let's leave it at that. Dad, sorry. Am I bothering you? I'll, I'll try to be more quiet. Shut the fuck up! The point I am trying to make is that replay value is incredible. The prologue sort of ends for every race slash origin story the moment you are recruited by the leader of Grey Wardens of Ferelden, Duncan. I say sort of ends because you are technically not free to go about your business in whatever order you desire until you get through the Battle of Ostagar, the cutscene of which is revolutionary, and now even more so than back in the day, as a modern system truly brings out the best in Dragon Age Origins. Towards the end of my journey with the game, I found a solution to all of these crashes. If you happen to experience them as well, download the LAA patch, link in the description, and if the problem persists, set the affinity in Task Manager to one CPU call only. You know, as I am braving the Kokari Wild, I realized that I forgot just how good this game is. Combat is fun, you get used to how it looks, kind of like arranged marriage, I assume. But even more importantly, quest design is great, the story is interesting, and there is none of this excessive New Age hand-holding bullshit. If you don't care about finding a secret, then the game won't be shoving a marker in your face to the point where the secret is no longer that, because you didn't have to go out of your way to go and get it, it was given to you. Anyway, before the Battle of Ostaga, after asking some Darkspawn to donate blood for their secret joining ritual, you are finally ready to join the ranks of Grey Wardens. This is when you find out that the reason the ritual is kept secret until the moment it begins is because becoming a Grey Warden is not necessarily synonymous with becoming a great hero who will bask in the glory of his deeds for the rest of his life. The Grey Warden's task is to battle the corruption, to cut down Darkspawn and protect humanity at all costs. To join their ranks, one must drink Duncan's secret soup made from tainted blood in order to become a warden. Most don't survive this ritual because the blood is poisonous and more often than not kills those who drink it, until it's convenient for it not to as shown in the Awakening expansion where out of six people partaking in the ritual, only one of them dies. It's definitely not the most dignified way to join ranks of any organization and it could also seem counterproductive at first glance. On the contrary actually, those with powerful immune systems are able to tame the corruption and turn it against the corrupted. They start sensing Darkspawn, they have visions that tell them where the Horde is headed, and just as importantly, they become immune to the taint, albeit not forever. So even if Darkspawn are defeated, a Warden will eventually succumb to the corruption. The most widespread belief about the origin of Darkspawn is that they were quite literally cursed by the Maker. Human mages considered themselves equal to him, and so they breached the gates of his golden city, Dragon Age's equivalent of uh, heaven, which understandably the Maker did not like. For he said, and I am paraphrasing, Yo, the fuck you think you're doing coming into my crib like that? I give you the fucking planet and it's not enough for you? Greedy fucking shit. I curse thee to run the earth as hideously deformed creatures. These vile monsters are compelled to seek out the old gods, who just so happen to be dragons, in order to corrupt them, turning a once magnificent beast into a winged horror, an archdemon commanding the horde. Side note, I can't help but notice the similarity between Monster Hunter's Valhazag and the Archdemon. A horde of Darkspawn led by an Archdemon is called a Blight, and the game takes place at the start of the fifth Blight. 
Now that I am done with the history lesson, we can move on to the actual story. It's a dark fantasy setting, but it's also so much more than that. It's all believable. There is betrayal, there are real problems that everybody you encounter faces, there is politics, there is prejudice and oppression. Turn Loghain betrays the king and the wardens by abandoning them during the battle at Ostega. His daughter being the queen, he sees the whole situation as an opportunity to usurp the throne and become the hero of Ferelden. That sort of shit is just feasible to me. Of course, as most of these types of stories go, not everybody is slaughtered. You and a senior recruit, Alistair, make it out alive. Flemeth, the infamous Witch of the Wild, magically saves the day by transforming into an eagle, or so we're told, and plucks us away from danger at the very last moment. Armed with the treaties that allow you to call upon dwarves, elves, mages and men to defend Ferelden from the blight, off you go to the village of Lothering, where you learn that after the Horde massacred everybody at Ostega, people have been running away and moving up north, abandoning their homes and children, as evidenced by this poor little fellow, whose mother must have been decked real fucking hard. There! One of their minions is already amongst us! This man bears their evil stench! Can you not see the vile blackness that fills him? Whoa, easy there, my man. You're treading on very thin ice. Wouldn't want to get me banned now, would you? Let's get back on track, because I feel that I may have been talking about everything and nothing at the same time, like women often do. <laughs> Once you're done solving problems of every villager in need in Bumblefuck Ferelden, you can go and do something that actually matters. Shit, even Morrigan, Flemeth's daughter, acknowledges the fact that you're pretty fucking useless at the whole Grey Wardening and Uniting front. So, we have come to solve every squabble in the village personally. My, but the Darkspawn will be impressed. Not counting the DLC, there are seven large areas which are often divided into smaller parts. For example, Redcliffe Castle and Redcliffe Village. I count these two as one area. I also don't consider Lake Callanhad Dogs to be a separate area either. Pretty much everywhere you visit is in shambles, and it's up to the main character and his band of delinquents to unite the entire fucking country, while the Archdemon patiently waits for you to take care of everything, which is pretty cool of him. To get the support of the Dalish Elves, you will have to undo the curse that is plaguing the forest. The too long didn't read version is that a while ago some human men were feeling particularly, um... Rapey. And so they kidnapped Zathrian's son, whom they have murdered, and his daughter, whom they have, um, de-virginated, so to speak. Zathrian is, by the way, the leader of the Dalish Elves of Brazilian Forest. That name gives me witchery vibes, as there is a forest called Brocilon, where sexy dryads kidnap lucky men to make more dryads. Zathrian cursed the humans by summoning a powerful spirit, which infected them with lycanthropy. Fast forward many generations, and the elves are in quite the pickle now. They are the ones being hunted by the werewolves, and are therefore unable to fight against the blight, even though you have a legal fucking paper that says, hey, you are obligated to help out. So, as the only Grey Warden whose balls have fully dropped, you plow through the endless array of furries, activist trees fighting against the paper industry, and through endangered species. To get the Sodomite's support, you will have to side with the Foxy Plant Babe or the Krusty Baldo. Naturally, the blood that's generally reserved for my brain immediately rushed down to my thunderous chode upon witnessing her beauty, and without a second thought, I turned my dwarven gaze towards Zathrian. I unsheathed my weapons of mass destruction and ganged up on him in the name of Floral Pussy. And by the way, for my more sophisticated homies watching this, there are mods out there that specifically tailor for sick freaks like yourselves. Listen, let's be honest for a second, I'm about 3000 words in at the moment, which tells me that the video is already at least 20 minutes long, and I don't think there are many people willing to sit through a 3 hour long video about a video game series nobody is playing, so let me just quickly blast through the rest of the storyline. As with the elves, every other faction is in some sort of predicament, and conveniently enough, you're the only one in all of Ferelden capable of more than just standing around and washing off the skid marks from your underwear. Harry prepubescents of Ozama need your aid in choosing the new king, finding their dunk-eating offspring. 
chasing yeah. pork and establishing organized religion, which is really a front for money laundering for the Chantry. The Earl of Redcliffe drank outdated milk and fell into a coma, while his son is blackmailing the Earl's brother into becoming a performer, all because the boy saw him simping for a Twitch cosplayer, whose channel you have to get banned through whatever means necessary. To cure the Arl, you need to sprinkle some holy lady dust on him, and to get your hands on it, you must commit genocide against an entire population of Scottish villagers. The Circle of Magi is of course no different than the aforementioned factions, full of dim-witted vegetables. My ma'am used to say they don't got no stone to protect them topside. If I go up there, I'm a gonna fall into the sky. Here, a blood mage decided that enough is enough, and it's high time to fuck shit up. Mages are considered dangerous because of their innate connection to the Fade. Fade is the dream world where demons reside. Demons who continuously seek out weak-minded and bitch-willed mages to possess and cause all kinds of shenanigans in the real world. You deserve more. You deserve a rest. The world will go on without you. Blood magic is forbidden because it is often used to consort with the demons. So, long story short, the mage turned other mages into abominations and went on a rampage. Templars, who are basically drug-sniffing dogs with swords, except here, blood magic is the cocaine, have sealed off the tower and are awaiting handwritten and stamped permission from the capital to beat the living shit out of every dress-wearing, staff-wielding beta still inside the tower. Conveniently, you show up and save the day like the legend that you are. Once you're done bending over backwards for the entire country, you are ready to meet up with the nobles to try to unite them behind one leader and one cause. Of course, turn Logan, who isn't just a slimy piece of shit. As I've previously mentioned, he's also the Queen's father. He's there to sour your grapes. He means to piss all over them by having more followers than you. God only knows how, because I count four nobles that side with me, and only three with him. And yet, a fight breaks out. Then again, I read so many of these fucking codex entries that my brain very well could resemble a pile of shit at this point. Once our little tussle is stopped by the Chantry, I can select my champion to duel Logan for the crown. Ah, uh, Warden, no. I'm afraid we can't leave the fate of all Ferelden up to your dog. Fuck. Once you're done rupturing Logain's internal organs, you can prepare for the final showdown against the Archdemon. Preparations include talking it out with your band of criminals and inseminating Morrigan, so that once killed, the Archdemon doesn't make a horcrux out of you or Alistair. Instead, it will latch onto the little baby warden. Let me just quickly say that Alistair's speech here, while dangerously close to infringing on Peter Jackson's copyright, gave me actual chills. Very cool, Alistair. 10 out of 10. Once the guy who mere minutes ago gave you the whole I am the oldest warden here, I will be the one to slay the beast and sacrifice myself in the process. <laughs> Once that guy commits suicide, you get to battle it out at up for Draken and eventually slay the old god. It's a real shame that my dwarven aim ain't too good because he is currently stabbing the concrete. If you haven't guessed yet, I love the story of Dragon Age Origins. It is deep, it is dark, and has no filler bullshit like a lot of other games. Now, I wish I could say the same about all the DLCs BioDaddy has released under the influence of all the illegal substances EA's money bought for him. But I'm afraid this isn't a perfect world. In a perfect world, men like me would not exist. But this is not a perfect world. Day 1 DLCs include Warden's Keep, where we help Levy Dryden in clearing the long-lost fortress of Soldier's Peak. It's short and sweet, which is exactly how women describe my dick. The area is overrun by living dead and demons alike. That's because the Grey Wardens, to whom the fortress belonged, ripped the veil which separates the real world and spirit realm by abusing blood magic. They did this because some king, whose name I no longer remember, declared them traitors and set out to eradicate their order. The Stone Prisoner DLC, also pretty good, gave us an extra companion, a sentient golem named Shale. My chisel of character evaluation, however, will have to wait until I get to their companions section of this video. As far as the story goes, it is once again short and sweet. A mage lived in the village of Honleith, and he liked to experiment. 
Not like you or I might by seeing whether adding an extra scoop of butter will add more flavour to our potato puree. No, he experimented by binding spirits to Shale's stone cold and rock hard body. Obviously, it doesn't go well, our little scientist dies, and the demon escapes to wreak havoc upon the villagers. When we get to Honleith, it's overrun by Darkspawn, which we dispatch, we try to tuck it out with the evil kitty here, we fail, and we watch the little girl get possessed, and subsequently send her on a one-way ride to meet up with Jesus. As the main story progresses and we visit the deep roads, Shale will also have an extra quest for us in search of her identity. This lets us explore a new, more brightly colored part of the underground tunnels. That's it when it comes to Day 1 DLCs. Next up, they released a Tale of Ozama, apparently, on 9th of December, and considering that I have not heard about it until this very moment, it's safe to say it doesn't count. I only mention this in case some mouth breeder wants to tell me that I missed one add-on. I am one step ahead of you, Grasshopper. Return to Ostaga, released on 29th of January 2010, and this is where things start to look a little bleak. Oh gee, I wonder what this one's about. They looked at Ostagar, and some sweaty neckbeard in the office said, Hey, what if we like just, like, covered this entire area in snow and sold it separately as DLC? Verbatim. Biodaddy's corpo senses have kicked in. Thus, this DLC came to be. Return to Ostagar is bland to the point where I can't even come up with anything to describe it to you. Reused area? Check. Reused monsters? Check. Reused cutscenes? Check. It adds nothing new to the story unless you bring Alistair with you to tuck your ear off, which I didn't do because I played on Nightmare, and two tanks are not what I needed to face the generous amount of enemies thrown at you. The DLC also tried to generate some emotional response from me, judging by how they present King Kaelin's stiff, lifeless body. Which, by the way, how the fuck is it still not decomposed? Thing is, you spend maybe five minutes with Kaelin before he gets a visit from the shady chiropractor, so seeing him nailed to the cross like that evokes a lesser emotional response than winning a solitaire tournament. The only things I enjoyed about this DLC more than I enjoy, say, watching paint dry were the armor set and weapons. All aboard! The Darkspawn Chronicles released on 18th of May, 2010. You take on the role of one of Archdemon's vanguards during the Siege of Ferelden. It's fun for a while, especially when playing as the Shriek. That was cool, like playing as Predator. But the novelty wears off long before the game wraps it up, so I only played it for the sake of knowing what I'm talking about, as is, unfortunately, the case for the next few DLCs. Liliana's Song came out on July 6th, 2010. You play as the red-headed Orlesian bard Leliana. And since that's who you control, I wouldn't blame you if you thought the game would take place in Orlais, especially when a lot of the game's dialogue is sacrificed to it. So much so, in fact, that just looking at Leliana by the end of the game makes me want to jump straight through the window, allowing shards of glass to shave the flesh of my bones, while the impact of my head smashing against the concrete deletes me from existence. <sighs> You would be wrong, my friends, in assuming that Bio Daddy would give you a new area to explore. Keep dreaming, you cuck! No, you will run around the streets of Denerim, as you have been doing the entire fucking game, and you're gonna like it. Marjolaine? Marjolaine! Don't tease me today! <laughs> That's how we do it! Uh. Ooh, pretty thing. Out of breath, hair in a state. You'd be a scandal on the streets of Orlais. And you love it. Yeah, I get it. Liliana and Marjolaine engage in activities some would describe as abhorrent, others as delightful. I'm on the delightful side, but that's just me. That's beside the point though, as this doesn't no. add anything to the story. David Gader, who was the lead writer for Dragon Age Origins, spent a little too much time with J.K. Rowling, I think. The Golems of Amgarak, released on 10th of August 2010. This masterfully crafted cash grab takes place throughout the deep roads. Some new environment, some old, and that's fine. This DLC really did not get along with my PC though, as I crashed more than ever before. I persevered through though, because that's what I do. That's how brave I am. When faced with adversity of video games crashing, I rise up to the challenge. Am I a hero? I really can't say. 
But yes, yes I am. Anyway, what little good the story tries to do here is obnoxiously undermined by gameplay and combat. This ain't even Dragon Age anymore. Why the fuck am I fighting four or six golems at once? The companions you have at your disposal are also too fucking big for their own good. Meaning they can get through tight spaces and as a result they're oftentimes about as useful as having a degree in gender studies. Witch Hunt came out on the 7th of September 2010. It features exciting areas such as basement and the first floor of Circle of Magi. Shale's take and a new area filled with some of the most dickishly placed enemies I have seen in a long time. And what doesn't help is the fact that the area is about as long as the underappreciated honeybee's lifespan. Story Morrigan left after the Archdemon was slain, as she said she would. I also told her, it's cool beans fam, you do you. But now I am tracking her down for reasons that elude me to this day. You meet this skag first, then you buddy up with this queef and off you go, searching for pieces of the equivalent of the vanishing cabinet from Lord of the Rings. You do get to battle a unique boss, Vartaral, which was pretty cool I will admit, and Morrigan does give you some much needed exposition as to what exactly is going on, but ultimately the last 10 minutes of this DLC were not worth suffering through the other two hours. Finally, we arrive at Awakening, not a shitty DLC but an actual expansion, and my god they outdone themselves with this. Playing Awakening almost made me forget about the shit Bio Daddy's been pumping out recently, it's so good. From companions and various NPCs you come across to new monster designs and environments, Awakening features six companions, five of which are new, and the other one is Ogren, who I didn't particularly like in the main game. We do have similar tastes, me and him though. Well, hey, if it isn't the recruit with a great rack. Talk about immersion. You have two warrior companions, two rogues and two mages and unlike in the main game they can all be rebuilt from scratch with the help of a handy respec book. And if you're like me and you're prone to not thinking and respecting your character only to realize you fucked up, it's no big deal, you can always buy more of them. Ogren and Justice are warriors. Justice is Dragon Age's equivalent of Tyrael, he is a spirit that's been trapped in a human body. He's compelled to do good and to aid you on your quest. I sure hope he doesn't join ISIS and I certainly hope he doesn't end up bombing Catholic churches in later installments in the series. Nathaniel and Sigron are your rogues, both have their own reasons for helping you. Nathaniel was more or less drafted under threat of being hanged which often leads to death. He is a righteous man suffering the consequences of his father's crimes against Ferelden. Zigron, on the other hand, was a part of the Legion of the Dead, an order of dwarven warriors whose purpose is guarding the lands from Darkspawn. She is as skilled in dual-handed combat as she is hideous. Look at that absolute troglodyte, my god! Lastly, you have two mages, Anders, who is one of my favorite companions out of the entire series. He's basically Alistair turned up to 11. He is more Alistair than Alistair himself. Go figure. A wise cracking apostate with a penchant for healing injuries that you get from playing on Nightmare and getting blasted by everything and everybody, including your own team. Luckily, my Harry Chodester is so thick that not even listening to Liliana talk shit for what seems like eternity can bring him down. And the last companion is Veilana. Her hobbies include killing humans and bothering trees. She's kind of a bitch actually and I don't really like her. Thing is, she's not a poorly written character, it's just that, um, let me put it you, this way. You. If I needed a kidney transplant and Veilana was the only one willing to donate it to me, I would rather die. I wonder how many people make it this far into the video. Probably not a lot. <laughs> You can tell that they really just went all out on this expansion. Whatever they felt like they couldn't have covered in the main game, they just added in with Awakening. You are now the commander of Grey Waldens of... Yes. You heard it here first, folks. You are not the commander of Grey Waldens. You are commander of Grey Waldens. Let's, let's find, yeah, let's go with that. You've got your own keep and you're under attack by intelligent darkspawn. They talk, they think and they have a goal, not unlike a social justice warrior. 
a darkspawn emissary, former Tavinta Magister, now called the Architect, is seeking to put an end to Blight entirely by having Darkspawn partake in a joining ritual not too different from the one you went through to become a Grey Walden. By drinking the blood of Grey Waldens, they gain resistance to the so-called Song of the Old Gods, which compels Darkspawn to seek them out. The main antagonist is a brood mother to whom everybody refers to as Mother. She is not a, um, uh, a fan of being free from the Call of the Dragon. Dragons, and so she goes rogue and lays siege to your fortress and the neighboring lands. And that's about the gist of it. Solid, well thought out, and interesting from start to finish. Now that we have all DLCs and expansions covered, we can get back to the main game and its companions, of which there are nine, if you include Shale. I will now rank them individually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why are you even watching this video? Look at yourself. Go outside, go do something with your life. You make me sick. <laughs> My absolute favorite is Morrigan. Intelligent, unapologetic, and unafraid to speak her mind when she doesn't like something or someone, mostly Alistair. There it is, loathering, pretty as a painting. Ah, so you have finally decided to rejoin us, have you? Falling on your blade in grief seemed like too much trouble, I take it. Is my being upset so hard to understand? Have you never lost someone important to you? Just what would you do if your mother died? Before or after I stopped laughing. Of the two of you that remain, are you not the senior Grey Warden here? I find it curious that you allow another to lead while you follow. You find that curious, do you? In fact, you defer to a new recruit. Is this the policy of the Grey Wardens, or simply a personal one? What do you want to hear? That I prefer to follow? I do. You sound so very defensive. The old circle hag win. And I know what we face. And if the circle is indeed lost, and all the me You want us to assist this preachy schoolmistress? To rescue these pathetic excuses for mages? They allow themselves to be corralled like cattle. Mindless. Now their masters have chosen death for them, and I say... Let them have it. And your stupid decisions. Oh, lovely. Shall we next begin rescuing kittens from trees? Second place goes to Alistair, the class clown and original wisecrack. To travel along Alistair is to be in a good traveling mood. A visual definition of follower. And despite this, he still rises up to the occasion of ruling Ferelden. Next up, Shale, the bird-hating golem. <laughs> Shale is funny, and more importantly, loyal. A dwarven woman transformed into a somewhat underwhelming ally on the battlefield. Middle shelf companions, the equivalent of your neighborhood takeaway. You've tried the best, now try the rest. You've tried the best, now try the rest. Spacer's choice. Yes, nailed at that time. Sten, the racist giant. Get used to disappointment. People are not simple. They cannot be summarized for easy reference in the manner of the elves are a lithe, pointy-eared people who excel at poverty. Sten is a Kunari, a race of giants living by a set of stringent rules that seem unconceivable to a human. It's a great shame that Bio Daddy didn't think far enough ahead to give them the appearance that they have in the sequels. The Kunari you meet in Dragon Age 2 are very clearly physically superior to other races. Next up, we have your Mabari, a war dog. I named mine Manji. He is everything you could want in a dog. Unfortunately, his battle talents are lacking at best, so I highly recommend installing the mod that allows you to use him as a fifth companion on your travels throughout Ferelden. Otherwise, it just doesn't make strategic sense to have him in your party if you're playing on Nightmare. And last midlet on my list, Liliana. The Orlesian Bard. Good for lockpicking, dealing decent damage, and making you truly grateful to have people like Alistair and Morrigan in your party. Owing to Liliana's inability to just shut the fuck up. We finally arrive at the bottom shelf party members. Their existence and the fact that I have to look at them are the reasons I turn to drink.
In fact, I bought a printer just so I can print their portraits and shower them with the contempt I have for them every morning. Awakening Ogren good, origins Ogren bad. Win, the wise old circle shrew that's only in my party because nobody waves a health stick the way she does. And Zevran, the treacherous, skeevy little fuck who specializes in betrayal and stabbing you in the back. Role-playing elements, serious choices with serious consequences, a deep character creation system, immersive dialogue options that just keep on giving, and a meaningful build progression. There is nothing I would change or improve about the game from this perspective. She is perfect, just like my pillow crap. combat system is fun and quite deep. It is, however, undermined by sometimes more than incompetent AI. Manlet here could be engaged in a sweaty duel with the enemy, while my ranged companions strongly feel that they belong in the middle of this commotion, more often than not getting themselves killed in the process. Perhaps it is my fault. Maybe my leadership is just so piss poor that they would rather off themselves than to have to follow my directions any longer. Either way, it could have used some more work. You ever see someone in a supermarket and they're reading a label on a loaf of bread? And the longer their synapses are taking to fire off data necessary to compute, the more interested you are in seeing just how long one simpleton can analyze a bloomer. That's the kind of intelligence your companions exhibit at times. The synergies are there though, and eventually even a cheese-hogging dwarf like myself, who primarily focuses on being a training dummy for the enemy, can dish out some serious crits. If, however, through no fault of your own, you were under the impression that a game called Dragon Age Origins will have a lot of cool dragons just waiting to be hunted and fashioned into uh, pairs of shoes, you'd be wrong. Dragon Age Origins is great at origining, much worse at dragoning. Sentries, what do you see? It's in the clouds! Dragon! Yeah! Not counting the lesser, much less imposing drakes and dragonlings, there are technically three dragons in the entire game, one of which is kind of easy to miss, as you can only fight it if you gift the Black Grimoire to Morrigan. Graphically speaking, the game was very much a mixed boat when it came out. Um, how do I best describe this to you? Let's say you're at a party and... No, 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 that, that's no good. You rarely leave your burrow. Um... Uh, Let's say you uh, come across a thumbnail that piques your interest. And I think we all know what kind of thumbnail I am referring to. You click on it, meet cocked and ready, but then the video starts playing and it's really blurry, so you turn it off. That's as specific as I can be when it comes to Dragon Age Origins visual prowess. Character models and such look pretty good, but the environments were not given the same amount of care and affection as you can see for yourself. Music is overall decent, with some moments of brilliance here and there, but as I'm writing the script, I can't recall more than three tracks from the game, which kind of speaks for itself. Sound effects are definitely above average though, which helps in amplifying the feeling of being in this world yourself. As you run through the castle and you hear the sounds of your timbalance against the concrete, as you perform colonoscopy on the infidels using your sword, as you freeze those foolish enough to challenge your might, the game truly comes to life. Voice acting is pretty good too, but there are some that I grew especially dispassionate about. Marjo Lane comes to mind. All right, I think I've wasted enough of everybody's time, so let me wrap this up and go to sleep. My buttocks are hurting from sitting in this chair all day long. Even in 2021, I enjoyed the absolute shit out of this game. I haven't been so invested in a CRPG for a very long time, and for this reason, I believe it's only right to award Dragon Age Origins with badges of approval, joy and fine craftsmanship divided by bio daddy's troubling compulsions to make poor business decisions that's it for part one of this series next time we'll look into dragon age 2 and dragon age inquisition we'll dig a little deeper to see what exactly went wrong during the development we shall also have a look at the dread wolf rises and whether we should be excited for it or petrified of it until next time my chums and chumbets